All right. Thanks, uh, Carl. Um, and thanks to John and Valerie for putting up with some of my tardiness on getting you notes and slides for translators and various things. Um, thanks to AAFC and Carl and Bruno for organizing the uh, great list of speakers and all the research networks <clears throat> for a great event. Um, my name is Jason Grant, as Carl mentioned. I am a, a, a professor, an assistant professor of international trade at Virginia Tech. Um, I maintain an active interest in research program in regional and multilateral trade agreements, trade disputes, and related empirical techniques to measure their impacts. Uh, so it's a privilege to, to be a discussant on, on John Wally's paper. I, I didn't catch much of it, but I have had some time to look at his slides. So um, I'm not going to summarize the entire thing, but let me, uh, let me take away a few, a few key points for you and, and, and offer some of my own thoughts. Uh, the title in the program, um, I, I just simply title here uh, that I am a discussant uh, on John Wally's paper. The title in the program that you see is Proliferating Regionalism. Uh, what do we know about its impact on trade and, and preferences? Uh, the majority of my talk and some of the thoughts I offer at the end will, will touch on that theme. So today I want to discuss four points that I thought are worth, worth um, <clears throat> uh, looking at a little further uh, and a few cautionary notes about regionalism, the relationship with multilateralism and, and their associated impacts. Um, John provided an excellent historical backdrop and, and he's just a, a breadth of knowledge on on how these, some of the, the political um, um, undertones that go into some of these agreements. Um, and the trend towards regionalism, which we know from his presentation, began well before even European integration in 1957. Um, most commentators, though, and the headlines suggest, um, you can't miss it, uh, that the second regionalism, really, that began in the mid-90s has been one of the major international economic developments in the post-war era. <clears throat> So the first key point that I wanted to uh, touch on in John's presentation was that the growth of regionalism reflects a wide range of objectives, okay, both political, economic, geostrategic, uh, you name it. Um, older RTAs typically shared one thing in common, the reduction of trade barriers, sort of a market access technique. Um, recent RTAs have a range of objectives in mind, many of which are listed here. While economists naturally assume that the reduction of trade barriers among member nations is the foremost goal, political, geostrategic, and other non-economic interests are at play. Free trade agreements do not always lead to trade that is free, and agriculture is often the exception. As John pointed out, um, some RTAs are large with respect to the number and the size of its membership, but may be economically insignificant. <clears throat> This, uh, this graph here, uh, I'll just add this animation right now, shows pretty clearly, um, um, and, and as John discussed in his table, uh, the growth of regionalism, okay? Um, the database I tabulate here shows cumulative notifications to 2010 uh, of agreements that were, were fully in force, okay? Um, fully 206 agreements were in, in 2010, uh, and the flight towards regionalism seems to have climbed a major cliff starting in the mid-90s. <clears throat> of course, uh, counting agreements is flawed uh, to some extent because it assigns equal weight to all agreements, and we know that's not the case. Interestingly, the great majority of these are free trade agreements, FTAs, okay, which count for almost 83% of RTAs in force. The number of FTAs are up six-fold since 1995, while customs unions and partial or limited scope agreements witness less than a two-fold increase. Um, I'm reminded of Bill Watson's uh, a McGill University professor. As he puts it, as economists, we tend to think of, of these agreements as falling somewhere along a continuum between autarky um, and, a, and a perfectly single or a perfect economic union with a natural tendency to progress from autarky along that continuum over time. Countries evidently feel themselves under no such obligation. Okay? FTAs appear to be final destinations, and the path of, the path of least resistance excuse me, um, appears to be bilateral agreements, okay? which witness a sevenfold increase since 1995. <clears throat> However, as I will show, the failure of moving RTAs towards deeper integration, 
okay? And, and that in the form of, say, customs unions, common markets, and single economic unions, or just more aggressive liberalization in general, um, has big policy implications. Uh, I just quickly threw this up. As of November, mine was to 2010, the statistics. I can show you that this composition of the type of agreement, uh, free trade agreements, partial scope in red, and customs union uh, in green, the same composition appears. Most of the agreements are, in fact, 87% of them are FTAs, free trade agreements. So key point, the second key point that uh, John raised was that some authors assert there is no choice between RTAs and the WTO. They are inevitable twins, uh, which I thought was really interesting, and, and many authors have said this. Uh, but we have to remind ourselves that regionalism is not a substitute for multilateralism because the former discriminates and the latter does not. To the extent that MFN tariffs are low or zero, and a number of products are, the distortionary effects of FTAs then is less concerning. And there is evidence of this in recent studies John cited. So in some cases, Richard Baldwin was right. Liberalization begets more liberalization. The same is not true for agriculture, though, where MFN tariffs are not zero, nor are they low in some sectors. Thus, the potential for trade diversion exists. Exemption from a 40% beef tariff that the U.S. is set to enjoy by signing the FTA with Korea without bringing Canada to the table is surely valuable for the U.S., but quite damaging for Canada than if the multilateral system were able to reduce Korea's MFN tariff to, say, something like 10%, before the U.S. negotiated that agreement. The second cautionary note is that I believe, in theory, most isms are good, but regionalism and multilateralism may not be able to coexist going forward because regionalism clearly has the upper hand. It's not clear to me how the two can continue in tandem when there's very little, very little incentive left for multilateralism. Maybe we just need to revise our expectations of multilateralism in line with Baldwin. Maybe Baguadi was right in that um, we will end up with a spaghetti bowl of free trade agreements and complicated rules of origin with three or four major hubs, TPP-style meatballs, I like to say. <clears throat> the third key point <clears throat> that John raised was the multilateral system is essentially an RTA. It's essentially a regional agreement whose hub lies with a few key countries, U.S., Japan, and, and the EU. Historically, this has typically been the case, often at the expense of the WTO single undertaking principle of nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. But there are good reasons why the GATT WTO as a big regional agreement may, may no longer work. And this is based on what I call Bagwell and Steger's dilemmas. Okay, this is Kyle Bagwell and, and Bob Steger, uh, two prominent economists that have written a, a lot on, on the economics of the GATT. <clears throat> the first dilemma, what you get is what you give, okay? This is based on the fact that developed countries have very little concessions left to give, okay? Their tariffs on most products, excluding some agriculture sectors, are less than 5%, and many of them have participated in all eight GATT rounds since 1947. While we could argue that developed countries have concessions left to give in agriculture, it typically amounts to a handful of sectors, and I'm not convinced that to, some developing countries are willing to part with these. I'm sure many of you know what sectors I'm talking about for Canada. Um, the second dilemma there is called the latecomers problem. Bagwell and Steger uh, refer to the unprecedented scale to which developing countries have joined the WTO and now want a seat at the negotiating table, largely because they have been unhappy with the trade flow gains they were promised during the Uruguay round. The idea that they could free ride on MFN but still be sheltered from the umbrella of special and differential treatment. And the third dilemma is globalization fatigue that Bagwell and Steger mentioned. Uh, they simply state that may, we may have run out of momentum um, because developed countries may be content. They may, they may be just be happy with the current level of openness they've achieved since many of them negotiating since 1947. Okay? Interestingly, Bagwell and Steger uh, go on to suggest that maybe we need a developed country reset in terms of protection levels or a few rounds of negotiations between developing countries to achieve the level of protection consistent with their developed country counterparts. And the last key point, of course, we all want to know, uh, or mo uh, many of us want to know, including industry, what is the impact of RTAs, okay? uh, especially on trade? 
John's 2012 stock taking report compares the growth rate of, of RTA trade. It, we were having trouble hearing them, but they were, it was four years before and, and uh, or five years before and four years after uh, the entry into force of agreement. His numbers cast doubt on the effectiveness of RTAs um, and the significance of regionalism more generally. There, there is evidence of some accelerated RTA trade growth, the US, Australia, but more evidence of decelerated or flat trade growth no difference between the two periods before and after the agreement was signed. I'm not going to dispute uh, John's numbers. In fact, I have some evidence on the next slide uh, uh, which suggests my agreement with his findings. However, I do want to point out that the extent to which RTAs create trade may not be evident in the growth rates. Okay? Uh, in fact, RTA trade growth may be flat or even decelerating, but the intensity of intra-regional trade among members may be rising. Okay? Evidence of this was found in NAFTA for certain years where world trade was falling, but the intensity of intra-regional NAFTA trade was actually becoming more concentrated. Okay? And uh, Tang and Thornton and others have found this in ASEAN nations during the Asian financial crisis. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not going to try and um, um, uh, cite, uh, promote my own work here, but I do want to at least point out something that we recently found. Okay? And that's a clear picture of, of where regionalism has and has not worked for agriculture, which has implications for Canada's free trade strategies. Okay? Um, in a recent publication, I assembled a, a new database of, uh, of trade flows covering 40 years, 150 countries, um, a recent econometric uh, advances that are suggested in the academic literature. I won't bore you with those details. What is unique about this study, though, is I classified agreements. Okay? according to depths of economic integration. In other words, <clears throat> I just didn't want to understand the average effect of trade before and after an agreement came into force, but I wanted to know that is the depth of economic or trade liberalization ambition that is pursued by the agreement somehow correlated or does it affect the outcome, meaning the impact on trade that the agreement has? Okay? Um, so these are um, deep integration agreements, uh, mostly Customs Union, as you can imagine, moderate integration agreements, predominantly the FTAs actually all fall on, uh, on the moderate scale where they liberalize some sectors but many others are excluded, and shallow integration agreements, and these are limited scope partial or partial scope agreements. Okay? What we found was quite illuminating. The only RTAs that actually stimulated interregional agricultural trade in any meaningful way were the deep integration agreements. And as you can see, if you calculate this over time, over a 12-year time span, it was about a 120% increase, or actually these agreements roughly double members' trade after 12 years. Um, this actually, this result stands up even if we remove a European Union effect, really the elephant in the room there. Um, moderate and shallow integration uh, yielded statistically small, economically small and statistically insignificant, insignificant effects which I believe has important implications for Canada RTAs going forward. Um, what happened there? Okay, so if you remember that first graph I showed you, 90, over 90% 90 of agreements notified to the WTO and in force today are not deep integration agreements. Okay? So because of this, it's hard to escape the conclusion that the growth of regionalism may not be as significant as the headlines suggest, at least for agricultural trade. But why are 90% of RTAs largely inconsequential in terms of their, in their, their trade impacts for agriculture? Okay? I'm going to thank the WTO Statistics Division for the next slide, and that will be my last two slides, um, and Rohini Acharya in particular. We can show that ag trade liberalization, product by product, across um, Mm, seven or eight hundred different agricultural products is actually quite limited compared to the non-agricultural sector. Okay, so what you see here, what these dots represent are agreements. These are physical free trade agreements, regional trade agreements. Many times country pair ne negotiations within an agreement because um, often uh, larger regional trade agreements end up being an, a, um, a negotiation between partners. Um, for example, Canada's recent agreement with the EFTA, the European Free Trade Agreement, comprising Norway, Switzerland, and Iceland, has different liberalization schedules with Norway compared to Switzerland and Iceland, even though all, all countries are, are contained within the agreement. Okay, on the vertical axis, <clears throat> over here, 
okay, is uh, the percent of trade, imports, that were liberalized. Okay, and on the horizontal axis is the percent of RTA tariffs eliminated. Okay, that's down here. I'm sorry if you can't see that. That's the percent of t RTA tariffs that were actually eliminated, went to zero. Okay, this is entry into force, non-agricultural products. We see a pretty scattered picture. Okay, there is some liberalization right off the bat. This is year one of an agreement. Okay, um, but there is still liberalization to be done. Okay, well let's fast forward. Okay, to the end of the implementation period, meaning the transition of when tariffs uh, are scheduled to be phased out. What do we notice? Okay, we notice a, a, it's clear a large clustering in the top right hand corner. Percent of trade liberalized is very high, over 90%, and the percent of intra tariffs eliminated is also over 90%. Let me show you the agriculture picture, which you might imagine is not as rosy. <laughs> okay, so here's entry into force. Okay, this is about a, a little less than 100 agreements for which the WTO has statistics on. Okay, these are all the HS six digit level, for those of you that know the details, agricultural products that the WTO defines that compromises that sector, okay? Uh, what, what do we notice? Okay, a lot of clustering near uh, the bottom left. Okay, well, let's fast forward. Maybe agriculture just takes longer, right? Longer phase in, it's more sensitive sectors, 10 to 15 years. Let's fast forward then to the end of the implementation period. Okay, it's very different than the non-agricultural products. So even agriculture liberalization inside RTAs uh, continues to be sensitive. <clears throat> Just to give you a recent example, here's Canada EFTA. Here's Canada and the European Free Trade Agreement countries, Norway, Switzerland, and Iceland. That's their dot. <clears throat> All right. Um, the role of, of trade to grow Canada's agricultural economy is clear. If Bagel and Steger are correct and globalization fatigue has set in, Canada needs to pursue RTAs and agriculture needs to be on a list of negotiating topics. The potential for trade diversion exists because of relatively high MFN tariffs in some key sectors that are of interest to Canada's agricultural export sectors. Okay? Second, Canada needs to pay attention to what the U.S. is doing okay? uh, with its FTA priorities, simply because of the degree of integration between the two economies. Okay? Finally, Canada needs to be prepared to negotiate deeper integration agreements. I believe these are where the real gains from trade and agriculture come from, but it also means Canada might have to put dairy, eggs, and poultry on the negotiating table. Thanks for the opportunity to be a discussant. <clears throat>